Welcome, Mr. D D this is Chris in Geneva. How are you, sir? We'll just do a quick audio test. I can see you fine. If I can just check you can hear me okay. And if you I can, can, I can... I can hear you fine. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you perfectly. Thank you for joining. Brilliant. Thank you. And I see our friend Slim joining us all the way from South Africa. How are you, sir? I can see you on the screen well. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can hear you clearly. Hello, Richard. How are you? Hey, hey Slim. Good to see you. Good, good. Thanks, Christopher. Thank you. Welcome. Thank you so much for joining us. We have a slightly delayed start. We already have quite a few journalists on the line, so we're just going to stand by as we wait for the others to join us, please.
Welcome, Dr. Berkeley. We'll just do a very quick audio check if you have two seconds for us. Yes, of course, as you always. Hear is okay, and I can see you fine. Thank you so much. Okay, thanks. I might just mute you until we start, if that's okay. No okay. problem. Hi, Seth. How are you? Hello. <laughs> How are you, Slim? Nice to see you. I <laughs> nice imagine you didn't you. have a lot of sleep this weekend. <laughs> oh, you know, we take it in our stride. Nothing in this virus, you know, is over what uh, I, it's, everything is unexpected. So we just deal with it as it comes. I think I heard you say that a pre about a previous virus, but anyway. We'll... <laughs> Absolutely. Cool. Lovely to see you both, Richard. All and the you. journalists will hear this. this is, and this just is to remind live. everyone that we already have some 200 journalists on the call just waiting for us to start. So in other words, shut up. <laughs> yeah.
Uh, hello, everyone. I am Fadila Shaib speaking to you from uh, WHO headquarters in Geneva and welcoming you to our global COVID-19 press conference today, Monday, 8 February. I would like to uh, start this press conference by um, sending my apologies for the delay in starting this press conference. Sorry for that. Uh, we will have uh, three special guests today that Dr. Tedros will introduce shortly. We have simultaneous interpretation in the six UN official languages plus Portuguese and Hindi. Let me introduce to you the WHO participants present in the room are WHO Director General Dr. Tedros, Dr. Mike Ryan, Executive Director Health Emergencies Program, Dr. Maria von Kerkov, Technical Lead for COVID-19, Dr. Mariangela Shimau, Assistant Director General Access to Medicines and Health Products, Dr. Sumia Swaminathan, Chief Scientist, Dr. Bruce Elward, Special Advisor to Director General and Lead on Act Accelerator, Dr. Kate O'Brien, Director Immunization, Vaccines and Biologicals. Welcome all. Now, without further ado, I will hand over to Dr. Tedros for his opening remarks and introduce our three guests. Over to you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you, Fadila. First of all, I would like to apologize. Sorry for, uh, you know, keeping you waiting. Uh, we had a meeting that took longer than we expected, many of my colleagues here and myself. So apologies for that. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. Yesterday, a new case of Ebola was reported near the city of Butembo in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. Butembo is the North Kivu province. It is in the no North Kivu province, where a previous outbreak was declared over in June last year. The woman who sadly has died was married to an Ebola survivor. Thanks to the enormous capacity built during the latest outbreak, provincial health authorities have significant experience in responding to Ebola and in preventing onward transmission. More than 70 contacts have been identified and WHO is supporting local and national authorities to trace them and provide care where needed. So far, no other cases have been identified, but it's possible there will be further cases because the woman had contact with many people after she became symptomatic. Vaccines are being sent to the area, and we hope that vaccination will start as soon as possible. WHO has sent a rapid response team to provide support as needed. The Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine is one of several that has been shown to be effective in preventing severe disease, hospitalization, and death from COVID-19. The emergence of new variants of the virus has raised questions about the potential impact of those variants on vaccines. Yesterday, South Africa announced that it was putting a temporary hold on the rollout of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine after a study showed it was minimally effective at preventing mild to moderate disease caused by a variant first identified in South Africa. This is clearly concerning news. However, there are some important caveats. Given the limited sample size of the trial and the younger, healthier profile of the participants, it's important to determine whether or not the vaccine remains effective in preventing more severe illness. These results are a reminder that we need to do everything we can to reduce circulation of the virus with proven public health measures. Several countries are succeeding in suppress suppressing transmission, including those where new variants are circulating. We all have a role to play in protecting vaccines. Every time you decide to stay at home, to avoid crowds, to wear a mask or to clean your hands, you're denying the virus the opportunity to spread and the opportunity to change in ways that could make vaccines less effective. It also seems increasingly clear that manufacturers will have 
to adjust to the evolution of the virus, taking into account the latest variants for future shots, including boosters. We know viruses mutate, and we know we have to be ready to adapt vaccines so they remain effective. This is what happens with flu, with flu vaccines, which are updated twice a year to match the dominant strains. WHO has an existing mechanism for tracking and evaluating variants of the virus that causes COVID-19. It's vital that countries continue to report these variants to WHO so we can coordinate global efforts to monitor their impact and advise countries accordingly. We are now expanding that mechanism to provide guidance to manufacturers and countries on changes that may be needed for vaccines. These developments highlight why it's so important to scale up manufacturing and roll out vaccines as quickly as possible and as widely as possible to protect people before they're exposed to new variants. We also need to continue designing and conducting new trials, and we need to keep a close eye on the impact vaccines are having on epidemiology, severe disease, and death so we can use vaccines to maximum effect. WHO Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, or SAGE, has met today to review the Oxford-AstraZeneca vaccine and to discuss these new developments. Tomorrow, I will meet with the chair of the SAGE to discuss its recommendations. To say more about the new study in South Africa and its implications, I'm pleased to welcome Professor Salim Abdul Karim, the co-chair co of South Africa's Ministerial Advisory Committee on COVID-19. Professor Abdul Karim, thank you for joining us today, and you have the floor. Thank you very much, Dr. Tedros. It's indeed a pleasure and an honor to be here with you. I'll just briefly share with you the reasons behind the South African decision and how we are viewing the situation. So put very simply, we have been monitoring how the different vaccines are stacking up in terms of their laboratory assays, whether they tested in a pseudovirion assay or in a live virus plaque assay. To date, five of the eight vaccines that we've been monitoring have had these laboratory assays. What they show is that vaccine-induced antibodies have greater difficulty neutralizing the 501Y V2 variant than they have against pre-existing variants. We saw uh, substantial declines in some vaccines and less so in others. So for example, with Pfizer and the Sinopharm vaccines, we saw minimal reduction in the potency of the antibodies and minimum changes in neutralization activity. However, with other vaccines, such as the AstraZeneca vaccine, we saw very substantial reductions in neutralizing uh, activity. We don't fully understand what those laboratory results mean, so we need clinical data. Fortunately, three of the vaccines have been tested in South Africa, where the 501YV2 variant constitutes about 80 to 90 percent of the circulating viruses. The first results that we heard were from a vaccine produced by Novavax. And there we heard quite concerningly that the efficacy of the vaccine was 89% in the UK, but only 49% in South Africa. That was the first indication that efficacy levels would be diminished in, in, in addressing the 501YV2 variant. Most recently, we saw this week, there is a release of a uh, study. It's quite a small study with 2,026 participants, largely young individuals. And one of the important things is that the trial used uh, a dosing interval that is quite short compared to the newer, longer intervals that are being proposed by AstraZeneca. So looking at that, what was shown 
that while the overall efficacy of the AstraZeneca vaccine was 66% in the largest study that include the UK, Brazil, and South Africa, the South African data on its own showed only 22% efficacy. It should be noted it has a very wide confidence interval that includes even 60% protection in that confidence interval. But that study, which looked at only mild and moderate infections, raised concerns. Not because that we were not expecting uh, some diminishing activity, but it was the level to which it was diminished. And so now we are unclear and uncertain about the efficacy of the vaccine to in preventing hospitalization and severe disease. We know from the overall trial that the AstraZeneca vaccine is effective against other pre-existing variants. We're just not confident about its efficacy against the 501YV2 variant. And so we've proposed an alternative approach, a new approach to the way in which to roll out the vaccine. And one proposal that's currently being considered is to roll it out initially just in a stepped manner, where the first step includes about 100,000 individuals that are vaccinated in which we monitor the hospitalization rates. If they are below the threshold that we are looking for, then we're confident that the vaccine is effective again in preventing hospitalization, and then we can roll it out. Alternatively, if it's above that threshold, then we need to look at alternatives. So put very simply, we don't want to end up with a situation where we've vaccinated a million people or two million people with a vaccine that may not be effective in preventing hospitalization and severe disease. We think that in order to do so, we have a more prudent way in which we can do that, which is to make an assessment and then roll it out on the grander scheme. So all, we are, all that has been suggested at this point is to delay the rollout of the AstraZeneca vaccine until we have the processes in place to undertake this kind of stepwise implementation approach. On that note, Dr. Tedros, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much. Professor Abdel Karim, and we appreciate everything you're doing in South Africa and globally in the fight against COVID-19, as you have done for so many years in the fight against HIV. You have our respect and appreciation, Professor. In the next few days, WHO expects to make a decision on the emergency use listing of the Oxford AstraZeneca vaccine for the two sites in India and the Republic of Korea, which will produce it for COVAX. We're committed to using all available data to make this assessment. In the meantime, COVAX continues to prepare for its first quarter distribution and to add to its vaccine portfolio. To discuss the implications of this new development in South Africa for COVAX, I'm pleased to be joined today by Dr. Seth Berkeley, the Chief Executive Officer of Gavi. Seth, Welcome once again, and you have the floor. Thank you, Dr. Tedros, and also a thank you, Professor Karim. It's good to have um, you here with us. Um, you know, you don't have to be an epidemiologist, as Dr. Tedros said, to know that these viruses evolve and mutate over time. I think the events of the, of the past weeks, the emergence of these new uh, variants, and, and this has been a sequential conversation. We've heard about the B117, known as the UK one. We just heard about the South African one. There's also one in Brazil that is known as P1. Um, you know, what this serves to highlight that our scientific response needs to adapt if we're going to successfully beat this pandemic. It isn't simple. It isn't going to be um, uh, one strain globally. Um, so from the perspective of COVAX, the vaccine pillar of the ACT Accelerator, there are a number of lessons that are important from these events. The first is that manufacturers must be prepared to adjust the COVID-19, um, uh, uh, adjust to COVID-19 viral evolution, including potentially providing future booster shots um, and or adapted vaccines if found to be scientifically necessary. We don't know that now, but that is something that obviously needs to be carefully followed. 
It's also clear that trials have to be designed and maintained to allow efficacy to be assessed over time and to be of sufficient scale and diversity to enable clear interpretations of the results. Um, we know that we need much better global genomic surveillance, and that has to be backed by rapid sharing of data to allow for the global coordination of response. And then lastly, and I know this has been said, but it needs to be emphasized, priority needs to be given to vaccinating high-risk groups everywhere to ensure maximum global protection against old and new strains and to minimize, as best as the vaccine can, the risk of transmission because we know the more that the virus is allowed to spread, the more it is allowed to be transmitted, the more opportunity it has to adapt and, and, and mutate. All of this underlines the need for a global multilateral solution based upon the principles of equitable access. It also underlines the need for a diverse portfolio of vaccine candidates suitable for all context, setting, and events. In terms of COVAX, we have signed advanced purchase agreements with AstraZeneca and the Serum Institute of India, and we've published plans to distribute near, nearly 350 million doses in the first half of the year, hopefully starting later this month, should the emergency use listing be forthcoming that Dr. Tedros just talked about. And of course, this is the first of many vaccines. We'll also be looking at the SAGE guidance um, that you heard about in terms of, of their views on the best use of this vaccine in different groups and in different areas. Um, we're continuing to work through our partner, CEPI, and Richard Hatchett, CEPI's CEO, is on this call to optimize and extend the value of these existing vaccines. We're looking to continue to procure new candidates for our portfolio for use later in the year, including ones that would be adapted for the new variants if scientifically indicated. As we have done up until now, we'll continue to keep you updated on all these developments as and when they occur. Uh, so thanks for giving me a chance to speak and back over to you, Dr. Tedros. Thank you. Thank you so much, Seth. And we look forward to our continued partnership to roll out vaccines. I would also like to welcome Dr. Richard Heichet, the CEO of CEPI, which is a key partner in COVAX. And Richard is also available to answer questions from journalists. Thank you once again to all our guests and apologies for the delay. And Fadila, back to you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros, and to our guest. I will now open the floor to questions from members of the media. I remind you that you need to raise your hand using the raise your hand icon in order to get in the queue uh, to be able to ask your question. Um, I would like now to start this uh, uh, session uh, by inviting um, Sophie Mokwena, SABC, South Africa, to ask the first question. Sophie? Uh, you have the floor. Hello. Hello. So Sophie. Hello. Yes. Uh, my name is Sophie Mkwena from SABC in South Africa. I just want to find out from the panel. We know that uh, during the Spanish uh, flu in 1918, the pandemic uh, was deadly to senior citizens and later to young generations because of the very same problem of uh, perhaps uh, uh, the change of uh, the virus itself. Did the scientists, uh, particularly people with a better know-how, not anticipate that uh, this virus will mutate and uh, we might have problems so that the developers of the vaccine and manufacturers must take that into consideration? Because what guarantee do we have that during the third wave, it will not have uh, uh, another form? and. Uh, previous vaccine, vaccines won't be effective. Thank you, Sophie. Uh, your question is well understood. Uh, 
Dr. Mike Ryan. I can start with you and continue. I, mean, I, I think the issue is in 1918, we didn't even know this was a, an actual virus causing uh, influenza at that time. Um, so therefore, uh, there were three distinct peaks in terms of age groups in the 1918-1919 pandemic. We had the classic peaks in the younger, very young, and classic peaks in the very old. But what we had very unusually was a huge peak amongst young individuals, particularly amongst young men. Some of that may have been due to the virus. Some of that may have been due to the mixing of people and the bringing together of young men in camps. But it was a fulminant disease that killed uh, very, very quickly and had that very distinct uh, shape. Uh, the, the first, second and third waves, the second wave was larger than the first wave. And again, we don't know that, but the virus may have becoming uh, more fit to the transmission in the human population and the first wave may have been better adapted <clears throat> in the second wave. And that's what happens. Flu viruses adapt and they evolve over time. Uh, and you see that every year as we change the vaccine strain uh, every year, the strains that are in the vaccine. We look at the predominant strains, the most successful strains that are circulating, and the ones that are causing clinical illness. We track the epidemiology of the viruses, we track the type of the viruses, we track the proteins on the surface of the cells, we track their genetic sequences, and every year we're able to give clear instructions to manufacturers on how to adapt influenza vaccines. Uh, I think <clears throat> with the same kind of approach here, uh, with the same sort of diligence, both in epidemiology and genetic sequencing, and in <clears throat> doing the observational and other studies we're going to need to do to understand vaccine efficacy, I believe we can track this virus. We have the tools that they did not have in 1918 or 19, and we have the means to adapt and be flexible and react to what we see. So I'm confident that if the scientific public health and governmental worlds come together, we can have a strategy <clears throat> that will adequately adapt to the emergence of variants. Yes, and if I could outline a little bit about that strategy, because it is developing over time and it is getting stronger um, over time. So as this is the first coronavirus pandemic the world has ever seen, um, we have established surveillance systems around the world, as you know, looking for where the virus is by tracking individuals who are infected with this virus. But along with that, um, scientists and virologists have been tracking the virus itself and any changes in the genome of the virus itself, looking at mutations and the virus evolution, which is a natural process for all viruses and all, all pathogens. And what we've been doing through our virus evolution network and our, our laboratory network um, and through the improvements of genomic sequencing around the world, um, countries have been sequencing viruses in their countries and they have been sharing those viruses on publicly available platforms like GISAID and others so that the changes in the virus uh, can be evaluated, they can be studied, um, and that we can determine what they mean. Because even if viruses change all the time, what is really critical is to have an assessment framework uh, in place so that we can determine if any of these changes reflect a, a result in a change in transmission, transmissibility, uh, reflect any changes in disease presentation and severity, and importantly, if any of these changes have any impact on available and future diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. In recognizing that this was important for us to be monitoring, um, we formulated our virus evolution working group in June to have an assessment framework to determine what studies were necessary in the lab um, where we could look at specific mutations, but also variants of interest, because we need to determine which ones of those are important to become variants of concern. And now what we're looking to is building on existing systems like we have for influenza. Um, how do we take the knowledge of the way that these vaccines behave in terms of the neutralizing response and in terms of the impact of these, of these uh, vaccines, but not only vaccines, also therapeutics and diagnostics to say, this is important and therefore there may be a change necessary for the vaccines. So that is a process and a mechanism that is being enhanced as the Director General said in his speech today. Um, but again, we're not starting from scratch. This is what scientists do. It requires a robust framework to detect these mutations and variants. It requires strong collaboration across scientists and labs around the world so that uh, studies are done to actually properly assess the potential impacts of these, of these viruses and also to inform vaccine composition. 
So there's a lot that's in process here. Um, it is going, it is, will become stronger um, as the months go on, and it really requires the help and the persistence of everything from epidemiologic surveillance all the way through good collaborations with manufacturers. Uh, thank you. Uh, I would like now to invite uh, Mr. Richard Hatchett, CEO CEPI, uh, to add some uh, uh, elements. You have the floor, sir. No, thank you. And uh, Sophie, thank you for the question. Just uh, to say that, as, as, as Maria and, and Mike have indicated, you know, we certainly have anticipated that the virus uh, could mutate. Um, in fact, scientists have working in laboratories uh, anticipated uh, some of the mutations. And, and this is one of the values, actually, of, of doing the science. It allows us to essentially to look into the future, to look at possibilities that may occur and to it, you know, help us look out for mutations that would be of concern uh, and, and, and interest, as, as Maria just outlined. Uh, certainly, the emergence of the new strains in South Africa and Brazil and the UK um, has given cause for concern. We had taken a risk management approach, um, not only through COVAX, but globally, uh, in terms of the approach to vaccine development and, and had undertaken the development of vaccines on a wide variety of platforms. Uh, the mRNA vaccines, of course, the viral vector vaccines like the AstraZeneca vaccine that we've been discussing, recombinant um, protein vaccines and inactivated vaccines. Uh, having that diversity of vaccine candidates actually provides us with a large number of tools which we need to explore now to see which work best against the variants that we have. We can also look at potentially at combinations of the vaccines that we have. And of course, we must accelerate the development of new strain-specific vaccines. And, and a large number of companies have already begun to undertake that work. And, and if um, the evolution of our understanding of these viral strains you know, suggests that we do need to progress those vaccines into, into clinical trials and then into use, we will do that um, as quickly as we possibly can. Thank you, sir. Um, I would like now to invite John Cohen from Science to ask the next question. John, you have the floor. Thank you so much for taking my question. Um, I, w I well recognize that this study in South Africa didn't have enough people or, or old enough people or people with comorbidities to answer the severity and hospitalization and death question. But we have a lot of data from other studies that suggest that vaccines that don't pr work particularly well against mild and moderate disease could possibly still keep people out of hospitals and prevent deaths. I'm curious, and I also recognize that WHO doesn't uh, tell countries what to do, but I'm curious what outside people, experts think about South Africa's decision to suspend the use in healthcare workers right now in order to wait to form the trial that uh, Salim, that Slim described. So I'm, cur I'm curious if you could address that. What do you think of that decision to suspend the use right now, given the potential that it could prevent people from being hospitalized and dying? Thank you, John. Dr. O'Brien will take this question. Thanks for that question. Um, I think underlying the question is really a recognition of what a dynamic situation it is right now. The evidence has uh, come out very recently within the past 24, 48 hours. Um, as uh, the Director General indicated, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization at WHO met today, along with the investigators uh, from the um, uh, trials that are being conducted in the UK and Brazil, uh, along with AstraZeneca and along with the investigators um, from the South Africa trials as, as well. And so we've, um, everybody's looking at the data right now, and there are um, a range of ways that this can be approached, but I think what was most, um, most clear that came out from uh, the SAGE meeting is that in looking at the evidence on the AstraZeneca vaccine um, across a number of trials, it is very clear that it has efficacy against severe disease, hospitalizations, and deaths. Um, among the variants and different variants, there is some reduction in, uh, some indications of reduction 
in the efficacy, some more, some less, depending on which variant, which population, and also uh, of the neutralizing antibody uh, uh, responses. But we also have evidence um, that there is the likelihood that the retention of meaningful uh, impact against severe disease is a very plausible scenario for the product against the B1351 variant. And so as South Africa deliberates on um, how they will handle the situation, recognizing that there are a range of products that they're looking at, and how to get more data on exactly what would um, sort of inform a greater and broader policy. Um, these are uh, discussions, as we've heard, um, that are continue to be underway about exactly, exactly how they will um, uh, use the vaccine that they have in hand um, to its maximum benefit and um, assure that there is evidence that can inform not only a broader policy in South Africa, but helps to inform policies around the world. So um, we'll, we'll see the final wording that comes out from SAGE on the use of the vaccine, um, but there was a very positive view about um, proceeding with the use of the vaccine, including in settings where variants um, are circulating with a big emphasis on collecting information that would really help um, as in the weeks to come and in the months to come to inform um, an optimization of those uses um, in different countries in different settings around the world. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I would like now to invite Christoph Vogt from IFP to ask the next question. Christoph, can you hear me? Yes, I can hear you. Thank you for taking my question. Um, I was just wondering uh, about everything we heard now about the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine, uh, and I can see how complicated it is, but um, how much does it affect the rollout, the number of vaccines that you can roll out and, and when uh, for the COVAX facility? It is the bulk of what you plan to, uh, to use for vaccination uh, in the next six months. So I was just wondering if you can give us an answer also after what uh, Dr. O'Brien just said, that maybe we should just roll out and, and use it to, to kind of prevent uh, um, more severe cases. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Christoph. Uh, Dr. Seth Berkeley will take this question. Um, so thank you for the question. And before I answer that question, let me just add one point to Kate's excellent question. And that is, we learn more about these vaccines as we work with them. And, and one important point about the AstraZeneca vaccine is it was studied originally with a dose interval between two, two doses of a month. As that vaccine has now gone through trials and observational studies have shown that, in fact, a longer dose interval increases the immune response and also increases the efficacy of the vaccine. So these types of learnings will occur with new vaccines. And that also means that, you know, in a study like the South African study, it was not optimized for what we know today is the, is the you know, the way to get the most immune response out of it, et cetera. And this is part of the debates and discussions that need to go on right now. But going back to the question, um, the AstraZeneca was really the first vaccine. Of course, we also have doses, a small amount of doses of the Pfizer vaccine now as well as early vaccines in the portfolio. But the idea was to try to get a very large portfolio of products, and we have done that. So we will be seeing other vaccines enter the portfolio and be available for participants of COVAX um, in the second quarter. And so it is true that initially it'll be mostly AstraZeneca and Pfizer that are moving forward, but then there'll be more vaccines. And of course, as Dr. Hatchett said, one of the things we'll be looking at is whether 
you know, any or, or uh, all of these vaccines need to be adapted and adjusted either in the way they're being used or even in the actual um, uh, makeup of the vaccine. So this is an evolving science, as you heard from uh, Kate, and we will continue to work as COVAX to ask the question, what is the best way to move forward? But at the moment, at least, and we'll wait for the SAGE guidance, um, um, it looks like um, uh, the, the AstraZeneca vaccine is an efficacious vaccine. It's been um, reviewed by um, a number of stringent regulatory authorities and gotten approval and had studies in, 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 in many countries, including efficacy against severe disease, as you've heard, including efficacy against um, um, some of the, um, the, the changing variants. And therefore, we suspect that we will continue to roll that out and will continue to follow the effects of that vaccine over time. Over. Uh, thank you, Dr. Berkeley. I would like to invite Professor Salim Abdul Karim uh, to also provide uh, some uh, elements to this question. Professor, you have the floor. Thank you very much. Just to add a quick comment, that even in the South African setting, we, are, we were scheduled to roll out the AstraZeneca vaccine in just over a week from now. We anticipate that the initial start date of vaccinations will be largely unaffected or at most affected by a few days. But instead of rolling out AstraZeneca vaccine, we'll be rolling out the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. And that will give us a bit of time and leeway to ensure that we're collecting the necessary data as we roll out the AstraZeneca in a stepwise process. So it doesn't really materially affect our start date. It may affect the rate at which we escalate if we start running short of doses. But as it stands, it should not affect much else. Thank you. Thank you, Professor. I would like now to invite um, a Brazilian journalist, Sara Teofilo, from Corriero Brasiliense, to ask the next question. Sara, you have the floor. Hi, thank you for taking my question. Um, still on the subject of the variant in South Africa and the suspension of the use of the Oxford vaccine, uh, in Brazil, we also have a variant identified in Amazonas, as was said here today. And we know it is a different variant, but does the organization have any orientation to Brazil? Uh, should the government suspend the, the use of the AstraZeneca vaccines and use the other vaccines until we know that this variant does not interfere with the, effective the effectiveness of the vaccine? Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. You have the floor. Thank you for that question. And again, just to repeat what others have said, you know, we are seeing, uh, we're learning a lot. There are uncertainties still. We don't have answers to all questions. The SAGE, the Strategic Advisory Group of Experts on Immunization, is reviewing all the evidence that's available on uh, each of the vaccines from all the different studies, starting from very early clinical, you know, all the way to the phase three trials, and, and also taking into account what we know about uh, the different variants uh, and, and the experiments that have been done, both in the laboratory looking at neutralization assays, and if there's any clinical evidence, uh, taking that into account and will make recommendations uh, based on the available evidence. And of course, these can be updated and revised as more data becomes available. So all of our guidelines are meant to be, you know, updated, they're living guidelines, and we will, we will do that, but again, based on the best available uh, evidence. Countries, of course, you know, will make their own decisions based on additional information that they, they may have, and we can help them and work with them to make those, those decisions. Uh, one thing I would like to say is that there is an urgent need to collect more information and data. So even as countries are rolling out vaccines, whatever the vaccines may be, it's really important that we put in place uh, mechanisms to, to either do clinical trials where you can randomize, for example, the question about the optimal timing between the two doses, um, the question of you know, its efficacy in different age groups, the question of can you, is it better to use one vaccine followed by a different vaccine as a booster dose? All of these questions need to be answered. And uh, we would like to promote that kind of you know, good research, whether it's trials or whether it's observational studies, cohort that are monitored for both uh, 
effectiveness and safety, and then have a global uh, database where we keep learning uh, so that we use these vaccines more effectively, you know, even as, uh, as Richard Hatchett was saying from CEPI, we are investing in the development of more vaccines. Those trials need to be done as well. So I think the next few months are going to be important for us as we roll out to keep on learning and adapting our strategies. I don't know if you want to add anything, Kate? Yeah, if I can just add a couple of things. We did speak at SAGE about, um, about the P1 variant and the AstraZeneca vaccine and had an update on the, uh, the expectation about when we would have more information um, that, that would be evidence to inform um, decisions like this. I think it's so important that we recognize that um, information is going to continue coming out and we, we really have to sort of uh, sail a steady ship um, based on the preponderance of evidence and not lurch from one, uh, one particular report or another report because in science there is variability in, in the biology of how vaccines work in different populations at different points in time among different groups in populations. And so what's really critical is to look at um, as evidence emerges um, to look across all of the, the elements of the evidence, the structural biology of the virus itself and the variants, the nature of the vaccines that we're actually looking at, the, the ages of the people that were in clinical trials, the kind of disease that was actually monitored in the clinical trials, and each of these elements has an impact on what the expectation would be about the performance of the vaccine and therefore comparing from one piece of evidence to the next really can't be done without a sort of level playing field. So I think people really have to be ready to um, appreciate that we will have evidence that's going to come out that is going to be, um, at times, uh, have the appearance that it, it doesn't add up to one complete story. And that's because we're painting the picture um, in parts and pieces and bits as time is going on. But when we put all that evidence together, we have a clear way forward of the way in which we can most effectively use the vaccines while we're learning all the time about optimizing those products. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I believe uh, Mr. Richard Hatchett has something to add. You have the floor, sir. Sure, no, thank you. I, I just wanted to follow up on uh, Dr. Swaminathan's comments. She mentioned an, a number of studies that need to uh, be undertaken. I, I just wanted to flag that COVAX uh, through CEPI has issued a call for proposals. We've set aside $140 million to support the conduct of such studies, and that uh, call was placed, was opened about 10 days ago. So we, so we will support these necessary studies to understand how to best use these vaccines. Thank you, sir. Um, I would like now to uh, call on Nadia Jui, a Tunisian journalist from uh, L'Economiste Maghreba. Nadia, can you hear me? Bon, uh, vous m'entendez? Je vous entends. Ah. Yes. Ah, parfait. Uh, bonsoir à tous. Je me présente Nadia de Jui. Je suis une journaliste tunisienne à L'Economiste Maghreba. Et uh, si c'est possible de poser la question en français. Oui, allez-y, je vous en prie. D'accord. Alors, ma question est la suivante. Concernant les nouveaux variants, en particulier ceux détectés initialement en Afrique du Sud et au Brésil, qui suscitent beaucoup d'interrogations dans, dans ces pays, certains, par exemple, prolongent l'isolement des porteurs de ces variants et ne les libèrent pas que sur la base d'un test PCR qui, euh, qui doit être négatif. Quel est, quel est l'avis aujourd'hui de l'Organisation mondiale de la, de la santé à ce sujet Merci. Thank you, uh, Nadia. I, I, can, I can start, uh, and others may want to come in on this. I'm, I'm not sure if I understand the, the question completely, but it's about the variants and about the viruses that people are infected with. I think first and foremost, we need to not stigmatize anyone that is infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, full stop, regardless of if it's the wild-type viruses that are circulating from the beginning or if these new variants that are circulating. Um, all of us are doing everything that we can 
to keep ourselves safe and keep our loved ones safe. And if we happen to be infected with this virus, we need proper protection and we need proper care um, and understanding from our loved ones and our employers so that we can get better and that we can take the necessary public health measures to prevent us from spreading that virus to someone else. Um, there is a lot that is not uh, well understood about all of these different virus variants that are being detected, but as you have heard us say, there are many studies that are underway and we are learning about these variants and this virus every day in real time. There are collaborations that are set up. There are relationships that WHO and our partners have with researchers in country who are carrying out studies as we speak, as we sit here explaining this to you, because everyone is working towards better understanding of how the viruses transmit, uh, the disease that they cause, the severity, um, that one may have if they are infected with these virus variants, and of course, any potential impacts of our countermeasures, like diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. So while we don't have all of the answers, uh, we never will, uh, we have systems in place to make sure that there is data sharing, that there's surveillance, that there's data sharing, that there's coordination around research that needs to be done, that there is a mechanism by which those results can be shared. There are uh, expert panels that are discussing these regularly to interpret what they mean as we know it at the time that we discuss it, and really importantly, that we outline the studies that are necessary going forward. Um, but I do want to highlight again that we shouldn't stigmatize anyone who is infected with SARS-CoV-2, the virus that causes COVID-19. We just need to make sure that we understand we're in this together and we provide the appropriate care and understanding for those who are infected and their loved ones who are contacts uh, and need to get through this. Uh, thank you. Um, I would like now to invite Peng Hui from People's Daily, Chinese journalist, to ask the next question. Uh, Peng Hui, are you with us? Hello, can you hear me? Okay, um, I would Hello, like, Annie? yeah, hello? Hello? Hi, can you hear me? Yes, uh, we can hear you. Go ahead, please. Thank you for taking my question. Uh, China de uh, declared last week that it had decided to provide 10, mi 10 million doses of vaccine to COVAX. So can you share more information about that? about the cooperation with China. Thank you. Um, Dr. Swaminathan, you have the floor. Yes, thank you for that question. Uh, as you know, you know, we want to work with uh, developers and manufacturers of vaccines all over the world. We need as many good vaccines, safe and efficacious vaccines as possible. China has several vaccines under development, and we are talking with, uh, with we are speaking with all of them, and um, uh, we are also looking at the dossiers for Sinopharm and, and Sinovac, and the team is in China, as Dr. Simao mentioned, um, and we've also heard from them that they would be willing to discuss with the Covax facility provision initially of 10 million doses over the next few months. So uh, we are very encouraged by that, and. This is, um, it's not a donation as we understand, but it, it will be a provision to the COVAX facility. So they will be discussing with the COVAX facility the terms and conditions under which this can be procured based of course upon the emergency use listing by WHO as well as uh, the guidance from SAGE. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Swami Nathan. I would like now to invite, to invite Simon Ateba from Africa News Today to ask the next question. Simon, you have the floor. Thank you for taking my question. This is Simon Ateba for Today News Africa in Washington, D.C. Hospitals in Malawi are now on the brink of collapse, overwhelmed by patients impacted by a COVID-19 variant first identified in South Africa. And the country needs only 40,000 vaccine doses to help vaccinate healthcare workers to continue to treat others. And this is the situation in other countries in Africa where healthcare workers need to be vaccinated first to take care of other people. What is the WHO, the COVAX, and others doing to ensure that healthcare workers are vaccinated right away, not in two weeks or in three weeks? And if I may ask, apart from rejoining the WHO, 
Is President Biden doing anything to help Africa's vaccination effort? Thank you. Two questions, Simon. <laughs> okay, uh, Dr. Bruce Elward will take your first question. Yeah, thank you very much, Simon. Everybody is deeply concerned about the rollout of vaccines globally, and everyone, it's not just WHO, everyone we work with doing everything possible to scale up and ensure countries that have not yet been reached with products can be reached. So WHO is doing this um, in, in, in the context of the COVAX uh, uh, pillar of the ACT Accelerator that we work within, and Seth may want to make comments on this as well. But there's really a four-part approach we're taking to this right now, and we're doing all of this right in parallel. The first is to try and ensure that those products that we've contracted large volumes for and that we know are efficacious and safe, they get through the regulatory processes as rapidly as possible. And that is the, uh, the AstraZeneca vaccine, as Kate and others have spoken to already. The second thing we've been doing is working to expand the portfolio of vaccines, as Dr. Berkeley mentioned. So we're looking at other products that have already been licensed, the uh, Pfizer vaccine. We struck a deal with Pfizer two weeks ago, and we're looking at expanding on that. The third piece of work that we've done within the COVAX facility this has been done is to establish the capacity to um, take donations and doses that are shared from countries that feel that they are in a position to be sharing doses. So we establish the capacity to do that, which can be done immediately. And then the last thing that we're doing is we're working with um, other, uh, to, to assess other potential suppliers. I think uh, Mariangelo, someone referred already to the fact that we have a team on the ground uh, in China that's assessing the facilities at Sinovac and Sinopharm. Um, at the same time, we're looking at their dossiers, uh, their data, to see if those products could um, be suitable for, for consideration in, in, the, in the facility. So we've got a broad, four-pronged, at least, program of work. The other thing that we're doing is, as we do those things, in parallel, if things look very promising, we're going out with countries with indicative volumes of vaccines. As you saw, uh, uh, Dr. Berkeley's uh, team from, uh, from Gavi issued what we call the indicative volumes to be able to tell countries, here's how much vaccine you can expect uh, in the coming months so that they can prepare and prepare their timelines appropriately. And then linked to that, we are also already informing not just the countries, but informing the manufacturers of these products, look, this is the list of countries that you may need to be shipping vaccines to um, within the next week as some of these products uh, will have a, a final position on their, on their regulatory processes. So Simon, please rest assured that um, everybody working in COVAX, the partners working with them are doing everything possible to make sure that products arrive everywhere as rapidly as possible. But remember, we made a commitment when we established COVAX that we would make sure the vaccines that we deliver are safe, efficacious, and quality assured. We made that promise to the world, to the people of the world, and it takes time to examine everything possible on these uh, vaccines and make sure that they meet what are quite stringent uh, regulatory uh, requirements um, so that when they go out, people have the absolute confidence that these products are going to work and that they're going to be safe. Thank you. Dr. Ryan? Just on the specific issue of Malawi, and uh, certainly South Africa had seen a very rapid rise in cases, and, and that uh, rise is, is that's falling now. And a number of countries in Southern Africa, uh, Southern African area, including in Malawi, had seen a similar very rapid rise in the number of cases. I believe they peaked in Malawi with uh, 1,316 confirmed cases on the 22nd of January. That number has now fallen to 320 on the 7th of February, and that's been a persistent fall in the number of cases. And again, that's testament to all the other work that the government of Malawi are doing in terms of testing and isolating and quarantine and treating cases. That's happened in the absence of vaccines. Uh, we've seen similar falls across Europe, uh, even in areas where there's been high uh, proportion of um, variant strains associated with transmission. Uh, overall, when we look at variant strains, uh, uh, the, in some areas the data would suggest that they can be up to 30 or 50 percent more transmissible, but they're not <clears throat> uh, able to get around our defences. When those measures are applied, those public health and social measures, when people wear their masks, when people stay away from crowds, when people wash their hands, when people avoid crowded places, and when governments take the necessary action, uh, those numbers fall. 
uh, we need to continue to have those numbers to fall. And clearly, the understanding the impact of the, of the variants on transmission and on vaccine efficacy and others is very important. But I think the message is the measures we currently have in our toolkit work, and we need to apply them. They're our first line of defense. They are what are going to stop this disease getting out of control. This will keep the number of variants down and allow the vaccines to come in and do their job. And the primary job of vaccines right now is to reduce hospitalizations and death. And right now, the, the data on, I think, all of the vaccines and all of the situations, that they're working to do that. We may need second and third generation vaccines to do more. Uh, we may need better vaccines to do more than just stop deaths and stop hospitalizations. But right now, we have the tools to stop both by adequate control of the disease at community level and by the use of vaccines to protect the most vulnerable and our frontline health workers. And in emergency management, you've got to do what you can do now. You've got to face the realities you face now. And the realities we face now is we can suppress transmission and we can save lives. If we do that, we can take the next step. And rest assured, uh, the team here <clears throat> Kate and, and uh, Sumia and uh, Anna Maria and the R&D Blueprint and Richard and, and, and everyone outside, they're working hard to find those solutions on the vaccine side and working hard with our colleagues in the flu program to develop a system to monitor this and do this in a, in a sustainable way. But I do think we need to focus on what we have at our disposal. No one would like more than us, and going back to previous questions, we still want to see health workers and vulnerable people all over the world vaccinated. That is still a primary objective of this organization. And I think the partners in the ACT Accelerator, the partners in COVAX, uh, led by the DG, are, are, are making every effort to ensure that we can maximize the fair and equitable distribution of this vaccine. That is saving lives and can save more lives. Uh, thank you. I think we will take last question from Gabriel Steinhauser, um, Wall Street Journal. Gabriel, can you hear me? Yes, I can. Thank you so much. Can you hear me? Very well. Go ahead, please, Gabriel. Great. So given that it's going to take some time to get more evidence on how the AstraZeneca vaccine works with the South African variant, shouldn't COVAX uh, maybe prioritize other vaccines, such as the Vi Pfizer vaccine, for countries in Southern Africa where the same variant is dominant at the moment. C can't you shift some of these vaccines to those countries so that the frontline healthcare workers get the best protection that is available right now? Thank you, Dr. Swaminathan. You have the floor. So maybe I can start and then Dr. O'Brien can come in. Um, well, there are several issues here. The first one is I just want to repeat what, what Mike said. We mustn't start, uh, you know, concluding that this vaccine doesn't work at all. What we've seen is data from a small study. It's indicative. It is telling us we need to collect more data. We need to study it more. But from all the available evidence, the AZ vaccine and all the other vaccines that have been approved so far, reduce death, reduce hospitalized and reduce severe disease. And that's our goal for the first part of this pandemic is to reduce mortality, to end all preventable deaths. And so we must continue to, to scale up vaccines. Now, about which vaccine, it depends on what's available in the COVAX facility at a particular time and also what's feasible. And as you know, the Pfizer vaccine has uh, some special requirements, ultra cold chain, uh, storage uh, and transport, which is not available in, in all countries in Africa or in other parts of the world. So, so we've done an extensive mapping and Kate can speak to how, you know, this is, this has been looked at at the country level. Um, so that's, that's an important issue, but also it's the supplies and, um, it, the COVAX facility had uh, made, uh, pr prior arrangements to get uh, a lot of supplies of the uh, AZ vaccine in millions of doses, whereas with Pfizer, we have a very limited supply, especially in the first part of the year. So there are all of these considerations. And the important thing is to get these vaccines out to healthcare workers and other high-risk groups as soon as possible. Do you want to add some points, Kate? 
Yeah, I think the other thing to mention is that for um, pretty much all of the products, um, we do know that the efficacy against severe disease is a higher efficacy than against mild disease or just infection. Um, we're starting, starting to get some evidence around infection without um, people actually having disease. So we do expect this gradient. And I think um, especially for the AstraZeneca product, um, what we're, the sort of um, evidence, the absence of evidence is, uh, is the, the kind of key thing about what is the performance of the vaccine against severe disease of this particular variant. And the expectation is that it will have, um, a, there, a, there's a very plausible scenario where it will have efficacy of some magnitude against that severe disease. So I think what we want to also emphasize here is the reason to have a portfolio of vaccines in the COVAX facility and that is, are being pursued from a development perspective is that different vaccines are going to have um, uh, different performance characteristics. And when we get to a point of supply where we have that flexibility to be optimizing um, you know, products where we now have information about how they can best be used, and I think this is what we're talking about, about the optimization. But the optimization isn't just about the product itself, it's about how you use it. And so we've referenced before um, the information that is now more and more clear that the longer the interval between the two doses of this product, the higher the efficacy is. So again, I think what we're trying to emphasize is that we have a number of choices that any individual program can make about how to make best use of what's, what's available um, at a particular moment in time. Um, extending intervals, using products in some age groups with preference over other age groups, um, where we're really targeting an age group or a particular group largely for the protection against de severe disease or another group that isn't, doesn't have such high risk of that, but we're more concerned about um, uh, mild or moderate disease. So, so the choices that an individual country makes about how best to use the, the products uh, that are at hand um, is going to be a rather organic process at this, at this period of time where we're still learning so much about each of the products and the supply is increasing over time and available for, availability for any one particular geography um, has, has uh, variability compared with another geography. Thank you, Dr. O'Brien. I believe uh, Mr. Richard Hatchett has something to add. You have the floor, sir. Sure, no, I just wanted to build on the comments that Dr. Swaminathan and Dr. Ryan and, and Dr. O'Brien made um, with respect to the utility of, of the vaccines that we have. Uh, obviously, there is a world full of the wild type virus that the AstraZeneca vaccine is known to work against. So it is vastly too early to you know, be dismissing this vaccine as, as, you know, this is a very important part of the global response to the current pandemic. and and. We need to find better vaccines probably against the, the variants that are emerging, but that we still have a lot of information that we need to gather. Mike made a very important point that I, I think is worth underscoring. It's absolutely crucial to use the tools that we have as effectively as we possibly can. And, and that may mean ultimately when vaccine supplies, when vaccine supplies, um, you know, increase thinking about deploying certain vaccines to certain geographies. We don't have that luxury yet, um, but we we do have a suite of vaccine tools that we can we can probe and understand how to use them most effectively in the current state. We are working rapidly. Many of the companies are working rapidly, as I said, to develop um, new vaccines that are specific for the emerging strains, and we are also looking at second generation vaccines that have different attributes and that and that may provide broader protection. And ultimately, ideally, we would like to develop broadly protective COVID and even coronavirus vaccines. So there is a staged approach to the necessary research and development, but it is absolutely critical to continue to support that research and development so that we understand the tools that we have, we optimize them, and we develop the new tools that we will need for the future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. I would like now to invite Dr. Tedros for his final comments. Over to you, Dr. Tedros.
Thank you, Fadila. I would like to start by thanking our guests uh, today, uh, Professor Abdul Karim, Dr. Berkeley, and Dr. Hachet. Thank you so much uh, for joining and for your partnership. And also thank you to all who have joined today uh, to the media uh, community and look forward to seeing you again in our upcoming or next uh, presser. Thank you. All the best. Uh, thank you, Dr. Tedros. I remind journalists that we will be sending the audio file and Dr. Tedros' uh, remark right after the press conference. The full transcript of this press conference will be posted tomorrow on the WHO website. The press briefing is now closed. Thank you.